The information featured in this program is general in nature and therefore should not be relied upon. Guests appearing on the program may have commercial arrangements with some of the companies mentioned. Before making any investment, insurance or financial planning decisions, you should consult a licensed professional who can advise whether your decision is appropriate for you. take a fresh look at property all around the country. But before we get to your course, let's take a look at what's making news this week. And a program that aims to encourage city slickers to relocate to the bush in New South Wales will be expanded, the government has announced. The Regional Relocation Amendment Bill of 2013 was introduced to Parliament yesterday following an extensive review of the state's long-running decentralisation program. A $7,000 cash grant to assist in relocating to strategic regional areas will become available to more people, with eligibility now open to long-term renters in metropolitan Sydney, Newcastle and Wollongong. The legislative amendments will also lead to the introduction of a new skilled regional relocation incentive of $10,000 to encourage people to move from Sydney, Newcastle and Wollongong to take up employment in regional New South Wales. And real estate portal on thehouse.com.au has released a report revealing its top Australian suburbs for investors. The list of more than 50 localities has been generated based on rental yields and five-year capital growth predictions and takes into account surrounding industry, confidence ratings and employment opportunities. According to the website, Queensland took out the number one position with Morayfield, 40 kilometres north of the Brisbane CBD. New South Wales contributed six areas to the top ten, Mount Annan, Sanctuary Point, Carabar, Berkeley, Mossvale and Katoomba, with Ngangawal in the ACT, and I'll never know how to say that, and Seville Grove and Clarkson in WA. All the suburbs are fringe and regional localities, offering rental yields above 5.5%. Now with me tonight to discuss these stories and answer your questions is Noel Petrahilos from BMT and Louis Christopher from SQM Research. So if you do have a question for anyone on the panel tonight, you can call us right now on 1330 3435 or you can email it to property at skynews.com.au and welcome to the program. Welcome to you both. Thanks, Margaret. We get you, we've got your spelling right. I know that it doesn't look like it to you, but we do have it right. So now we know exactly how to spell your name. And I think I can say it now, too. Did yeah, I you, say you it right? It, you said it perfectly. Excellent. It's, it's Where does it come from? It's Greek. Ah. And the, the, the correct Greek way of saying it is Petrochilos, with a roll of the tongue. Hang on. But Petrochilos. Petrochilos. I can say that. So how's no Petrochilos going? Yeah, really well. We've been busy the last three months of the big tax time when everyone's visiting their accounts. So we've just been really busy, and you know, there's there's about twenty thousand accounts in Australia, and I think about nine and a half thousand of them refer their work to BMT. <laughs> so we've just been flat out keeping up with things, but it's been good. Do you get like seventy percent of your work in that three months, like accountants do? No, there's also um, people like to order their depreciation schedules before uh, the end of June, so they can claim their fee because the fee is one hundred percent tax deductible. Ah. So they like to be able to claim their fee straight back. So that pushes a group of them into that quarter, and the rest of them, unfortunately, they're a little bit lazy sometimes. They wait till they go visit their accountant, and then they yeah. come to us, and that all happens in July, August, September, October. Mm. And of yeah. course, there's the great companies like mine who teach our clients to get them as soon as they buy. Definitely, they should and do the pay-as-you-go vary withholding variation yeah. and claim their deductions on a fortnightly basis rather than wait to the end of the financial year. Absolutely. It's more money in their pocket earlier, it makes sense. And if we get time tonight, I'd like to actually talk about that because a lot of people are still unaware of exactly how that works. So if you've got some time, let's talk that through. Yeah, sure. Louis, welcome. 
Good to be back here, Margaret. You had an exciting day today. I believe something has been released. <laughs> yeah, when housing data comes out, of course I'm definitely excited. Uh, <laughs> Although you looked a bit depressed when you came in tonight. <laughs> it's it, Monday, it Margaret. Well, you know, well, it is you know how you like Mondays. <laughs> it is Monday. All right. we all, hey, isn't it funny? Monday really does make you feel bad. Did the housing data make you feel any better? No, look, no, no. Today's been good. Uh, look, yes, we had the ABS house price series come out. Now, this is the official house price series, of course, as various house price indexes as you're, you are well aware Margaret but today is the day where you see the official index come out and it recorded a 1.9 percent increase in real estate prices across the country for the September quarter. Sydney was leading the charge at over 3 percent for the quarter uh, wow. and I, if I recall the numbers Canberra recorded the worst result I think it was down 1 percent for mm. the quarter. No great surprise to us because we've been seeing rising stock levels, rising vacancy rates in that city and I think everybody's well aware of the potential job cuts which are coming. Yes, and I was very bearish on the ACT for probably the last two years anyway. So even before it started to come out in the figures, I just had a feeling about the ACT. It kind of went into that what I call perfect market state around about three years ago where there was a, that perfect balance between supply and demand and property prices were just pottering along nicely. Once you get to that point, no great demand, then we start to see things fall over a little. Well, it's a combination of softening demand plus an absolute peak in supply. I mean, uh, the construction activity, the construction of new apartments has only just been really completed now yeah. in the city. So it's almost been a bit of a perfect storm. But in time, the market will eventually bottom out. Uh, there'll be probably some good buying opportunities, in my opinion, in about two years from now. But between now and then, I think it's going to be fairly rough for existing homeowners. Mm. Now, look, I'm a little worried about Sydney because I know that it's going gangbusters at the moment. And sure I always is. worry about that. Um, you know, my biggest concern is and there are parts of Queensland where this is happening at the moment as well. Properties are being listed, uh, contracts are being taken on them immediately and then uh, basically offers are being made and properties are being uh, snapped up really quickly. What tends to happen under those circumstances is that in some of those areas where it's really hot, people start paying a little bit too much, they start wanting to just beat everybody else and they go up and up and up and up. And then when the buyer frenzy goes away in maybe a year or two, people who bought at the heat at that hype or the height of the market find themselves maybe they've paid, you know, thirty or forty thousand a month. If it's an owner occupied it's not such a big deal. But in investment you don't want to be doing that. Well, you know, they say uh, you know, basically sell high and, and buy when the price is low. Very hard to time these things, of course, Margaret. The Sydney market is running fairly hot right now. We think there's going to be at least another year left in it. Um, then it's going to be very much up to what interest rates actually do. Uh, put it this way, back in 2003 the market was well overvalued. Mm. Uh, now taking into account the recent run in the city market, we're nowhere near those overvalued levels we had back at that time, so there is still some runway left in the market. But yeah, look, we, we need to be a little bit cautious, particularly if we get an interest rate rise. And let's remember that most of this recovery has been actually investor-led, yes. investor-driven. Makes the market a little bit more speculative. Absolutely. Mm. Look, let's go to the phones and Lee from Gladstone. Welcome to the program. Hello, how are you? How, how is it up in Gladstone today? Oh, it's warm. Yes, I get it is. It's been very cold here, so uh, you're in a better position than we are. What can we do for you, Lee? Uh, yeah, look, I'm just ringing up for, um, to ask a question on... Um, we obviously up in Gladstone we bought sort of probably at the wrong time um, and we're looking at buying an investment and we're thinking of Hastings in Victoria. Mm. It's going to be our first investment and yeah, we just would like some advice on that. Now I get a feeling that one of two things is happening here. Either you're originally from that area or someone has something to sell you there because it seems a random choice for someone from Gladstone. Well, we are, we're from Melbourne, um, but um, nobody's selling us anything there. We just, with the new port that may or may not go ahead, that's what we're kind of thinking for yeah. long-term growth. Yes. All right, well, look, let's go to the panel and see what they're saying. Um, you know, Louis, a lot of people are hanging their hat on the new port. There's always 
a port or a marina or a golf course that people want to hang their hat on. Yeah. What do you Bunnings. think is go or a Bunnings is going to happen in Hastings? I don't know Hastings very well at all, Margaret, mm. just calling it straight. But looking at our stats for the area, which is postcode 3915, we're seeing stock levels at lower levels than what were recorded back in the last downturn of 2008. We're recording real, flat real estate price growth for the last 12 months and basically vacancy rates seem to be hovering at around 2%. Uh, it's neither not too hot nor too cold from what I can see on the stats. Mm. Uh, Noel, of course, you know, all of Melbourne people have been saying for a couple of months now it's probably not the time to buy. My opinion of most of Melbourne is if you didn't buy for a year and you went in, you'd be getting similar prices to what you're getting now. What are you guys seeing down there? We're seeing some of the regional, more regional areas. I mean, with depreciation, people usually on average take about a year to order their report, so we're about a year behind. Um, okay. but, but still, we're seeing activity in, in regional areas uh, in, in Melbourne and not, not so much right in the city, on the outer suburbs mm. and, on, and the little further out areas mm. um, like Ballarat and places like that. But I'm not 100% sure on Hastings. Um, mm. It's just one of, those, one of those places that it does. It doesn't pop up very often in the in the property uh, world. Which, so is, be... which is not a bad thing, Lee, that, you know, if you're not hearing about it doesn't mean you shouldn't be buying there. And, you know, I'm of the opinion that if you're hearing about it all the time, then you shouldn't be buying there because it's probably too late. If, if people are um, looking at buying in an area because they're reading about it in a magazine, it's probably overheated. In terms of Hastings and whether or not that port actually goes ahead, I think one of the things that it's going to rely on is that ring road to be able to link all all of um, those areas around through Moorable, um, Geelong, up into Sunbury, all the way back down to the port again. And I think under those circumstances, and of course they've just released a new plan in Melbourne called, I think they're calling it 2041, I could be wrong about that, but it is a new plan that is identifying actually these port hubs rather than just transport hubs. Um, it, look, it might go okay. Do I think it's going to go off any time in the next year or two? No, I don't, and I think it's more likely to be more of a long-term choice. So if you're investing in Hastings, I wouldn't expect to see much capital growth for the next four to five years. Um, I think it's going to be very quiet for that time, and I think it's going to depend on what actually ends up being developed down in those areas. Uh, you have to make sure that you're looking into areas where the development is sooner rather than later, and projects that are actual projects funded rather than just in, in the, the wings and a possibility. But apart from that, I don't think you'll lose your money if you're investing in Hastings in Victoria. Well, it's great to have you here this week. And of course, if you call or email and ask a question, you could get hold of a copy of my latest book. It's called How to Achieve Property Success. And no, it is not that book that you are seeing on the screen. That is the one before. Um, but, you know, maybe I'll send that one too. But How to Achieve Property Success, and I'm sure we'll have a screenshot of that next time round. Um, it's a combination of my first three books and not that book that you saw on the screen either. It's the complete guide to buying property and covers everything that you must know from tax and gearing right through to finance and conveyancing. Now, all you have to do is call us now on 1300 30 34 35 um, or email us at property at skynews.com.au with a question. Make sure you watch at the end of the show to see if you're the lucky person. We're off for a break. Don't go away. When we come back, we'll take some more calls and answer some email. Welcome back to Your Money, Your Call. Joining me tonight is Noel Petrahilos, or Petrahilos from BMT, <laughs> and Louis Christopher from SQM Research. And we're standing by to take your questions. Now, if you have one, grab the phone and call us on 30, 1300 30 34 35, or of course you can email us on property at skynews.com.au. Welcome to the program, Seba. Yep, hi. I'm look, I've just purchased a property in uh, Trigia in uh, Sydney's West, and uh, it's for about 350000 as a three-bedroom house and a one-bedroom granny flat at the back, okay. and it's renting uh, total rent from the three-bedroom house plus a granny flat is around 530 per week, yes. which is around 7.8% rental yield. The bank has valued at 350000 so I'm all ready to go. So I just wanted to get your opinion on, uh, on buying there. 
Well, you know, Zebra, it's probably a bit late to be asking that question. If you've already you bought it. There. <laughs> uh, do you have a contract on this property? Uh, yeah, I do. Okay, so you've got a contract, it's probably all exchanged. What are you going to do if we tell you it's a lousy place to buy? <laughs> I just want to go and well, get to know the long-term prospects, I guess. <laughs> so you can either be depressed or very, very happy. Yeah. Okay, well let's go to, to Louis and see what he has to say, Siva. Okay, so Tregear, well, what an area. Uh, of course, about uh, two years ago, uh, we forecasted that Sydney's West would outperform the overall Sydney-wide average, and that's exactly what's happened. Uh, for your information, our stats say that Trigear has gone up by 22.5% over the past 12 months, a massive increase. Uh, there's probably going to be about another year in it, then I think the market's going to become quite overvalued. Yields are coming down very quickly with that type of capital growth, so be careful about that. Long term, I think you're going to be fine. Short term, expect a correction sooner or later. Mm. Uh, maybe not in the next 12 months. Perhaps when we see the RBA lifting rates again at some point in the cycle, we'll get a correction out in Sydney's west. But uh, yeah, it's, it's running with a full head of steam right now, Margaret. And that's the exact correction that I was alluding to earlier in the show when I talked about all this buy a frenzy and you know people just snapping up these properties and particularly the ones with the granny flats on them. Um, you know, people are really into those at the moment, and so they are in danger of becoming that little bit overheated. But there's plenty out that way. It's not like it's sort of a remote area. It's not like it's a regional area. Uh, all around Blacktown and Penrith, there, there's a huge amount of infrastructure planned for the future. So, yeah, you know, I'm sure Steve is going to be okay. Noel, from your perspective, I'd like to ask the question for the benefit of the other viewers and Seba. This one comes with a granny flat. Yes. And what a lot of people don't realise is that when we talk about yield, we talk about the rent in relation to the purchase price. Mm. But in reality, the two things that this person has is two rents in relation to the purchase price. But to me, true yield is the one you take into account after all your tax deductions are claimed. Yes. He's in for some whopping deductions here, isn't he? He definitely is. And, and the granny flats are, uh, I mean, uh, uh, there's been, a, as you said, granny flats have been very popular the last couple of years. The planning has been a lot easier for granny flats, so people have been jumping on them. And look, what a, what a great yield he's getting there at 7.8%. The depreciation side of things, there's going to be all these extra deductions because the granny flat, um, looking at that area and, and what normally happens, would only be a few years old, hopefully, that granny flat. And right. these these granny flats get some really solid depreciation deductions so make sure you've got a good depreciation schedule for the house and the granny flat and you're claiming all those deductions that are available but um, as a cash flow property I mean it, it's, it looks pretty good at uh, 7.8% yeah. yield. So lucky you see but one of the things that you need to be able to do and one of my recommendations is always understand and be prepared for those times when areas where you buy is going to have a correction and during that time make sure that you're pouring as much money as you can into debt repayment. Now of course if you have a debt on your own home which is non-deductible pay that off first but if you don't have a debt on your own home pay off the debt on this property and that way during the period of time that it's correcting when it looks like it isn't growing you're still buying equity into that property by paying down debt and it won't stop you from leveraging again into more property a lot of people buy one property as an investment and it does very little for them and if you want to use your investments to retire on then you must be able to make sure that you get equity it's really the equity and the growth that helps you retire on a substantial income when the time comes so um, I think pretty pretty good job there Sipa you can go away and have a nice little drink and have one for me while you're there and be happy that you bought there <laughs> It's time for another break, but if you do have a question for us, call and you may get a copy of my brand new book, How to Achieve Property Success, if we read out your question and select you. Now, all you have to do is call us on 1300 30 3435, email us on property at skynews.com.au, but then make sure you watch at the end of the show to see if we choose you. And we'll be right back. Thanks for staying with us this evening. I have Noel Pedrahilos from BMT and Louis Christopher from SQM Research in the studio. 
I'm doing a great job answering your questions. So call us now on 1300 30 34 35 to join the queue. Or of course, if you'd rather, you can email it to us on property at skynews.com.au. And Richard did exactly that. And he has said, my question relates to building repairs, tax deductions and depreciation. Now I understand that repairs on a rental property are tax deductible, whereas improvements are depreciable. I have quotes from a builder for a number of different repairs, although there are a couple of line items which may not be considered repairs. Words like upgrade, paint and improve, mainly relating to water drainage and structural issues. My accountant leads me to believe that regardless of the repair versus improvement consideration, such building issues on a newly purchased property are capital expenses and not tax deductible. Now is this true and if so, how long does one need to own a property for after which repairs are considered tax deductible? That's a long question, Noel. It is a long question. I actually believe it has a short answer. Well, it is a, more of an accountant's question, but there, there is no period of time. It's more based on, for me, the work that's being done. Now, if you're adding value to something that is, or you're fixing something that's pre-existing when you've purchased, you're still adding value and it's still a capital improvement, therefore a depreciable expense. If you're bringing something back to its state it was when you purchased, then repairs and maintenance and 100% tax deductible straight up. Okay. Are yeah. you sure about that? Because my understanding, and I know that Julia Hartman watches every week and she will email me and tell me if I'm wrong about this, which I love it when she does that. Yeah. But my understanding is when you first buy it, anything that you do when you first buy it, because it hasn't become income producing for you yet, the only way around that is for him to wait a couple of weeks before he does any of the repairs and get a person in there. My, my look, there is a, it is, there's no hard line piece of legislation that says this is a period of time that you need to wait. Yeah, there's it, no period of time, but it has no. to be rented. It, it, if, if your intention is to produce income from that property, and, and the difference being that, if, that it's, you couldn't really claim, and what this question is about a repair and maintenance, claiming a repair and maintenance in that first two weeks, all those first few months, accounts often say no, and, and quite rightly, because everything they're doing, whether they are, if they are repairing a broken window, they bought that window broken so it's a, it is a capital improvement mm. and, and that's where uh -huh. I think a lot of that style of thinking comes from. Yes, yes, of um, course. So to us, if, the te if, a, if something does happen in that first few weeks and there's damages done, if it was bought with that item that was working and operating and they spent that money then that would be 100% tax deductible. Ah, okay. All right, yes, well g hopefully you got all that Richard. Um, I did too I think. So. Hopefully your accountant is then incorrect and some of those items may be deductible. I would just check with another accountant and if you really need to know, if you um, get the book Winning Property Tax Strategies from Julia Hartman and Noel Whitaker, which is very easily available, then I'm sure that will give you all of those details because it's a very, very good book. Dan from Sydney, uh, you're calling us about Blacktown. Uh, yes, I want to find out whether, I'm interested to buy a unit in Blacktown, or I want to find out whether Campbelltown is better or Blacktown or any other suburb you recommend in New South Wales. Okay, uh, very quickly, this one for you, Louis. Um, better or worse? Blacktown's certainly taking off more than Campbelltown at the moment, but in this case, I... long term. Oh, we might have lost a caller there, uh, but I'll continue on. I like Blacktown just over Campbelltown. Firstly, it's a little bit closer to the, the city. Firstly, I'm noticing a demographic change occurring in Blacktown as well, so the demographic is moving towards middle to slightly upper middle income earners. Yep. Uh, so income growth is actually grow, growing a little bit, little bit quicker than Campbelltown. I like it for the fact that it's on the railway line, so it's Campbelltown of course, no problem about that. The infrastructure I particularly like. Uh, when I'm looking at the vacancy rates at this point in time, we've got a 1.5% vacancy rate that's favouring landlords. It's looking good. Uh, same comments as those what I had through years before. Be careful, so it's been a big run. Blacktown for you. Um, I'm saying also Blacktown, but I urge you against the unit because Blacktown has a lot of families and I'm, I think the houses are going to perform better. You buy the kind of property that the demographic should demand, although with a changing demographic you might be okay with that unit. Just make sure you check out there's a demand for them first. It's great to have your company tonight. We're off for a break, but when we return you'll have another chance to get hold of a copy of my brand new book, How to Achieve Property Success. But you will have to ask a question and have it selected. Call us now on 1300 30 34 35 or email us on property at skynews.com.au.
Welcome back to Your Money, Your Call. I'm Margaret Lomas, and with me on the panel tonight is Noel Petrahilos from BMT, and Louis Christopher from SQM Research. Now, if you have a question that you think we can answer, I can tell you we can answer most of them. Call us now on 1300 30 34 35 or email us on property at skynews.com.au. Shan, welcome to the program. Hi, Margaret. How are you? Good. How are you going? Good, thanks. Good. Um, I just want to ask you, I've got an opportunity to purchase a car space um, adjacent to Sydney Airport. I just want to know what you thought of that. Okay. Now, Louis, off camera, I was mentioning that about 10 years ago, someone asked me about buying a car space in Sydney, in a building in Sydney. And I said that they'd be a stupid idea, that there's no way they'd grow in value, that the bank isn't going to secure it. And, of course, that's true. And lo and behold, this car space tripled in value, and it was the worst advice I've ever given. But I don't know whether there's anything left in car parks. Yeah, well, similar to you, Margaret, whenever I've looked at car parks as a value proposition, and I looked at the cash flows, I looked at the present values so at that point in time when I looked at them. They've always looked severely overvalued, mm. uh, and it's really hard to make the numbers work. Yet, like you, I've noticed that they just keep on going up in value here in Sydney mm. up to some ridiculous amounts. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you wanted to buy a car park in Sydney in the CBD, we're talking about prices up to $300,000 I know, and they were 30000 to get. Yeah. So they've actually gone up, you know, 1,000% now. Now, the, the reality is, is that... Um, the reason why we're seeing strong values is because the rental growth has actually been rather strong and it's clearly yeah. grown above the CPI. That's because of the general population increase in Sydney and the general population of executive workers and finance workers who are driving in. That's probably not going to stop in the meantime. I just still find it really susceptible to some type of major correction because they still seem overvalued. But mm. hey, I'm not a car park expert, am I? No, look, I don't think any of us are, and certainly you can't no. depreciate them, can you, Noel? You sure can. Oh, can you really? <laughs> yeah. oh, you what can... do you depreciate the concrete? You can look. There's the building component, the hard stuff. Oh, I guess um, if it's around the, the cover and... car yeah, park. Yeah, there's the two and a half percent on the structural element of the building. Yeah. You can claim all of that, and also a lot of car parks have a little Is percentage it of interest. Is two and a half percent? Because they're not residential. No, there's, they're, they're non-residential, so they fall into the commercial. Four percent. It's it's two and a half percent still. Four percent for travellers, accommodation, of and manufacturing. It is. I knew that. Yeah. So I mean, they still get their two and a half percent. They still have a little percentage of ownership of all of the plant and equipment around the place because they have common areas. Yes. And in those common areas, there's light fittings, lifts. there's lifts, there's all this stuff. So the depreciation side of things always works out quite good for them. You're just excited about every little thing that comes up, though, aren't you? I'm a little Shan, bit. look, I need to be honest with you. I, one of the things that's happening out there in Sydney Airport is parking's actually getting cheaper. I don't know if you guys have noticed that. Parking's getting cheaper. I park at the airport and now if I park, if I book seven days ahead, I can get it for like $80 for four days. It's fabulous. $20 more it gets me valet. Um, I, I don't know whether the area's right for car park, but one could argue that more and more people are travelling and therefore the car parks are going to be needed. Let's just put this down to speculative. And let's also say that you're not going to be able to secure it with the bank. So you are going to have to use up if you've got either cash of your own or valuable equity in your own residential property, which you could otherwise use to buy a less speculative investment. So I'd put it in the high risk category. No one on the panel is willing to say that they won't work because they might and they have. But if you're a high risk investor, maybe take the risk. But if you're not, I'd stay away from it. Louise from Hawks Nest, how can we help you? Uh, I notice that where mining uh, starts or is advertised in small towns, say in the Hunter Valley, often whole towns put their places on the market. Uh -huh. Like you go along and they, in some places like Casillas, mm. that I actually just went through the other day, they actually become ghost towns. Okay. Yet, when you go to rent a property in a town like Gloucester, the rents are very high. Um, to me, it would be a good investment to put money into some of these properties, some of which are very nice uh, looking, but would, would you be taking huge risks? Like what actually drives um, a town to 
lose money on what they um, uh, say to lose money on what people own, like people virtually walk off their properties, and yet to have very high rental where workers can't get. Mm. Uh, can't mm. seem to get, um, you know, reasonable, reasonably cheap rents. Mm. Well, well, look, Louis, I think the realities are that initially it might look like people are losing money and that they're all throwing their properties on the market because they want to get out before the mining takes off and before the miners move in. Um, I don't know if you've ever been on the pub flight from Perth, but a lot of miners in one area are very noisy, trust me. Um, but I think eventually, and often in the short term, they respond to that high rental return because the investors come in behind them, snap them up, and once people realise what's happening in town, that's when the prices start to go. We've seen it happening all over the place. Yeah, that, that may well be the case, but what we're also seeing right now is a real correction occurring in a number of mining towns. Karratha is one that comes to mind. Yeah. Uh, so about two years ago, rents actually got up to about $3,100 a week for a standard For a dollar. Home. Right? Okay? Yeah. Uh, 3100 a week. Now, there's been a correction on our numbers where the rents have come down to $1,800 a week and real estate prices have also had a major correction. Vacancy rates have lifted. This is an example of what happens when you see a mining downturn. Of course, Carafa is heavily exposed to iron ore. Um, it's a, a, you know, a single base economy town, so it's susceptible, particularly susceptible, to the global commodity cycle. Mm. And we have now had a correction. Anyone that's bought at the top there would be seriously regretting it right now. Mm. But there'll, there'll be a bottom eventually, but seriously high, seriously high volatility. You want to get your timing perfect exactly. in towns like these. We thought car parks were high risk. This is high risk on a much larger scale. You know, two years ago I was speaking over at the Perth Home Show and people were flocking to a couple of stands there selling the dongers in Karatha um, and Headland and a couple of the other places for somewhere in the region of a million dollars. And I say dongers, but they were little three bedroom nothing mm. houses. Mm. Um, and they were, people were coming to me and asking me, should we buy them? They're a million dollars, but they're getting $3,000 a week rent return. And I said to them all, run, do not buy them. You've got a big amount of money in the one basket. You've got a big reliance on the single tenant and the single industry, and mm. that's a volatile mix to have all of that together. Like, car, like the car park discussion, my advice to people is if you can afford to lose money, it's a speculative investment that can pay off if you get your timing right. But if you can't afford to lose your money, you shouldn't be in there. It's like buying pork belly futures, yeah. isn't it? If I had an existing portfolio of properties, uh, and I'm not going to go into my own personal uh, financial circumstances, then I would consider it yes. you know, as one of many in a portfolio. Certainly wouldn't be my first investment. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And uh, you agree? Oh, look, it's a big buy-in and, and it is a risk. And if you get the timing right, it, it, it can pay off. Yeah. But you've got to be prepared to hit the other side of it and, and lose some money. Unfortunately, as you said, there's one big industry there that's employing everyone that turns and uh, we see a bl bit of a bloodbath. Yep. I actually had another discussion at the Melbourne Home Show with a woman from Perth who was selling these properties and she was giving me a little bit of a hard time over drinks, no less, when we're supposed to be having a good time, uh, telling me that I was naive and that iron ore was the only uh, non-renewable resource in the world and therefore it would be constantly in demand. My point to her was that China's been stockpiling it for quite a while now and they will stop demanding it when they've got enough and it, lo and behold people who have uh, properties in those areas will definitely feel the pinch. Agreed. What goes up must come down sometimes, what goes up eventually. Must come down. Oh, don't say that because I hope my property portfolio doesn't go down. It's gone up a lot. And if that's going to come down, I need to get out now. Noel, do you really think it's going to come down? I think things, look, things work in cycles, there's no doubt. But properties are safe. But as long as you're in the long term, <laughs> yeah. and I'm you're not all in a mining it. town. And look, some mining towns do really well and will do for a long period of time. But, yeah. you know, it's one of those things. So I guess the answer to your question is look, I wouldn't be buying in a mining town unless you actually could afford to take that loss because there is that 
good chance that that will occur, maybe in your investing time frame, maybe not. But unless you're very sure of yourself, you've got money to lose, then just invest in those more reliable places that we've been talking about tonight where you know you're going to get a tenant, where you know there's great infrastructure and a diversity of employment. Um, you're going to certainly not make as much money, but you'll certainly cut those big losses as well. Thanks for being with us. Time for a break, but when we return, you'll have another chance to ask your question and possibly win the book of the week. Now, I still don't have a picture of how that looks, but I'm sure before the end of the show we'll be able to get it for you to show you what it looks like if you've won. Now, all you've got to do is call us now on 1300 30 3435 or email us on property at skynews.com.au. Welcome back to Your Money, Your Call. I'm Margaret Lomas, and joining me tonight on the show is Noel Petrahilos from BMT and Louis Christopher from SQM Research. Now, we've been answering your calls tonight, and if you have a question and would like to be in the running to get a copy of my brand new book, How to Achieve Property Success, call us now on 1300 30 34 35 or email us on property at skynews.com.au. Greg, you're from Mackay. How are you going? I'm going really well, and I'm really happy to have run you tonight. Excellent. Well, I'm happy that you called. I was up your way a couple of months ago. Okay. Chatting right. to your mayor. I missed you. Yeah, I looked for you, Greg. I couldn't <laughs> find anywhere. Okay. Are you ready? I'm ready. I have a house in Gracemere, mm -hmm. a house in Blackwater in Queensland, in, and a house in Mackay. Ooh. <laughs> you got to get you out of I'm happy to have run you tonight. <laughs> yeah. Now, the... The Blackwater house I've got quite a bit of equity in and um, I, the rents were $750 a week. I've now just leased it at 500 Yes. I'm still quite happy with that. Yes. And um, I guess the Gracemere place, it's gone down in rent. But I'm sort of happy with that and I'm happy with my Mackay place. But I think I'd like to get something a bit, po uh, you know, positive geared. I'd like to get some positive gearing in my portfolio, if you know what I mean. Yeah, look, maybe not even positive gearing, but maybe just leverage into something that's a bit uh, less prone to the regional variations and the mining stuff. Um, just to explain to the panel, Grayson is actually not necessarily mining influence because it's in Rockhampton. It's a newer suburb up there near Rockhampton. Um, but it was oversold a little while ago with lots of new house and land packages. And this is why Greg's now finding a variance in his rent return. Blackwater, of course, is mining influenced. And Mackay is a little bit of tourism and they say mining. But I think the big driver there is really the tourism market. Of course, you know, if mining's going gangbusters, then and tourism often isn't and vice versa. Um, you know, where do you reckon Greg should go next? Louis? Oh, Sydney? Yeah. <laughs> uh, look, you know, it's, uh, he, Greg's certainly got a lot of uh, real estate there up in North Queensland. Uh, as you've rightly said, the exposure Greg has is basically mining and tourism. Uh, both can have their, their good days and both can have their bad days simultaneously. Mm, yeah, you don't Mackay know right now, really interesting. We've got a vacancy rate of 5% and rising. Yes. So I wouldn't say it's had the best of, having the best of days right now. Rents are falling, so our real estate prices are down by about 5% uh, for this year. Uh, look, I would like to see Greg for his next property, yeah, but potentially uh, buying south uh, in all seriousness just to diversify against Queensland, I think that's the way to play for now because he's fairly concentrated in North Queensland. Mm, he is indeed. What do you think, Noel? Look, I'd be looking for an area that's got more of a mix of drivers rather than just the, the few particular drivers. Um, I, I grew up in Newcastle. I spent a lot of time in Newcastle when I was at university and I would be uh, having a look at the areas around there, not right in, the, in Newcastle City, but some of the outer suburbs. Um, where you can still pick up, you know, a house between three, four, five hundred thousand. They've got not amazing yields like he's probably seen in, in the areas that he's been in, but still solid yields. And there's a lot of drivers there. They're still a bit affected by the mines. There's the wine. There's tourism. Um, there's some. I guess there's a lot of businesses relocating there because it's cheaper to exist, and I think it's just got a good all-round, mm. uh, good all-round drivers to mm. offer. I agree, it does indeed. I agree. Let's not ignore the fact that you either have already or are about to have a land tax. 
problem with all the properties that you have in uh, Queensland. I don't know if the whole three of them are investments, but if they are, you certainly are going to be either peaking just over or already in land tax territory. And that's a tax that's highly avoidable just by diversifying into other states. I think you've got to be careful that you're not driven so much by the need to get positive gearing as you are by the need to diversify and get into an area with some really solid and diversified growth drivers. People are always looking for a particular cash outcome, but because they're doing that, they're looking short term and they're trying to pick up a property where it's a low buy in price and a high rent, that disparity normally exists for a particular reason and it's often because it's a single industry town. We rarely get really high rents um, and low buy-in prices in an area that has all of the diversified growth drivers. Look, I'm a big proponent of being able to get a positive cash flow but not at the cost of buying in an area that has the potential to grow sooner rather than later. You've got to be able to balance both of those off against each other and get what's right for you. I just downgrade the importance of that positive cash flow a little, try to go for something that's a bit more evenly geared but start to think about some of those areas that have families in them like uh, some of the suburbs of Penrith Shire which is going to get the wave on I believe from the Blacktown effect, uh, some of the areas around Frankston and down on the Mornington Peninsula not too far down just around Frankston itself because there's a big geographical shift out to those areas as more or less the pop populated central of Melbourne and possibly even some of the southern suburbs of Adelaide. Now in any of those you can probably get big subdividable blocks where you might be able to improve your income by doing a development or adding a granny flat. Both South Australia and WA incidentally are looking at some granny flat laws just like New South Wales and Queensland. So do a bit of diversifying and don't focus too much on just getting that positive cash flow. Time now for a viewer email and Paulina wrote, I have bought a house with a granny flat, speaking of which, which is tenanted at $185 a week. Does having an existing granny flat lift the value of the house? Now just quickly on this one, both of you, first of all, it helps with the cash flow, doesn't it, Noel, because of, we talked about that before. Definitely helps with the cash flow. You've really got to look at the demographics of the area um, when you're considering value. My, my little problem, I look, I love granny flats, I love the concept. My little problem is that just uh, the pool of potential purchases is just shortened. Like they're down to really to investors. Um, a family's not going to want to buy a place with a, another house out the back. They're yeah. probably going to want a backyard. Yeah, and that's exactly what I think too, Louis. There are areas where it might lift the value and there are areas where it will certainly dampen the value. I agree with your sentiments here. I think it does narrow the range of buyers down there. I wouldn't be interested in a granny flat, put it that way, mm. as much as I love my mother-in-law. <laughs> you know, um, well, I hope I she's just, watching. She is, I know she does. Uh, <laughs> uh, look, they, they just narrow it. Like, for example, if I was a buyer and I wanted to maybe put in a pool in that area, well, no longer can I do that. Or if I've got kids and I want them to run around in the backyard, yeah. they can't do that anymore. Uh, you know, let, let the potential buyer have a choice. Yes. And by putting in a granny flat, yep, it increases the, the rents, but you're taking choice away Yes. Uh, when it's time to sell. Yeah. And back to what I was saying before, cash flow is very important, and it's, it's, in, it's important enough to make sure that you don't have too negative a cash flow when you buy, because if you've got a big negative cash flow, you can't add more property, you just can't afford to. You might even be forced out of that market early if you're having financial difficulty. So cash flow is very, very important to me, but not at the cost of growth. And I think the granny flood options are pretty good, but they have to be in the right area. They have to be an area where you're fairly confident that you can sell it to someone else who won't mind having that granny flat in the backyard. My experience of them is they generally add around half their cost to value. And that's just my personal experience. It's not based on any kind of scientific formulas, but most people I know of who have built a granny flat have paid 100 for the granny flat and added roughly $50,000 to their value. And if you've got one at the moment that you say um, is worth 350 and you get 185 a week for the granny flat, I'd suggest that granny flat was probably 100 grand to build and the property probably wasn't worth 250 before you started. So um, can it lift the value? In the main, most likely not is the answer to that question.
it's great to have you here this week and of course if you call or email and ask a question you could get a copy of my latest book now it's called how to achieve property success and there it is and it looks fabulous doesn't it it's a combination of my first three books it's the complete guide to buying property and covers everything that you must know from tax and gearing right through the finance and conveyancing all you've got to do is call us now on 1330 3435 or email property at skynews.com.au with a question Make sure you watch at the end of the show to see if you're the lucky person. We're off for a break. Don't go away. When we come back, we'll take some more calls and, of course, answer all of your questions. Welcome back to Your Money, Your Call. I'm Margaret Lomas and it's been a great night with my expert panel, Noel Petrohilos from BMT and Louis Christopher from SQM Research. We've answered a lot of calls tonight and if you also have a question, call us now on 1330 34 35 or email us on property at skynews.com.au. Les, you've just gotten in at the end of the show. Oh yes, I, I want to find out where would be a good uh, suburb to invest about 350000 for a unit or a house. Okay, now that's a bit of a minefield given that how many suburbs are there in Australia, Louis? Do you know precisely? There's at least over 2,000 postcodes. 2,000 so, postcodes. Yeah, yeah. And of course, many, many, many more suburbs. You know, in WA oh, you get six suburbs. No, when I, when I try and answer this question, I like to look at regions. Um, thousands. Yes, you know. I agree. So literally yeah. thousands of suburbs and many of them would fall in this price range. So what are you going to suggest to Les? Oh, gee, you, you, you're going to be blown away by this response, mate. <laughs> you know how we've talked about the Gold Coast in many years? Ooh, oh, I am blown away. Yeah, I'm it. look, I, um, I think the market on the Gold Coast has come off by that much that I think there's some reasonable buying opportunities provided you do your research, particularly at the southern end. Now, you shouldn't give me that brown, Margaret. <laughs> I've looked at this very I'm, closely. I'm just uh, wondering whether we're running with the theory that it can't go down any further. No, we're not. We're not, because I'm seeing some good stats to suggest the market's actually already bottomed. Okay. Okay, and I like the fact that we do have a Commonwealth Games coming up there. I like the fact we're getting the light rail in, even though they're being delayed. Yeah. I don't like the fact that long-term that is an area where it's always well-supplied, so the developers always come in. If I am going to buy there, I probably would go something freestanding. Okay. Uh, so but I think I, I'm playing a contrarian here after God. being years of being a bear. I think finally there might be a reasonable time to look at the market there. Okay. Now, Les, I'm going to go with you should never be driven by a price range. You need to do the research, find the best area to invest in. If you can afford it, buy there. If you can't, find the second best area to invest in. If you can afford it, buy there. Don't be driven by a price range when you invest. That's it for now. Thanks so much for being here and for the great questions. And we'll be back next week with Michael Tees and Damien Collins. So be sure to tune in then. My guests this week, Noel Petrohilos from BMT and Louis Christopher from SQM Research, did a fabulous job. And I know that they'll be keen to be here next year to answer your questions. Thanks also to our callers and emails for your fabulous questions. Now, this week, our question of the week goes to Greg from Mackay. Greg, I think you could use a bit of help on how to choose the next area for you. So if you'd like to email me right now on your money, your call at destiny.com.au. That's your money, your call at destiny.com.au. I'll send you a copy of my brand new book, How to Achieve Property Success. Now, if you missed out on the book, you can get it from my online store at destiny.com.au. It's a great book and a must-have for every budding or experienced investor. You can also get it from all good bookstores and even some of the bad ones. Now, if you want to be ready to jump into 2014, ready to start or continue your investment portfolio, you've got time to join our last round of Essential Property Education courses at your local Destiny branch in Sydney, Melbourne, Brisbane, Adelaide and Perth. Jump on the website for all of the details. For those of you in Melbourne, I'll be running the last course of the year in December. Thanks for being with us and I'll see you again next week. The information featured in this program is general in nature and therefore should not be relied upon. Guests appearing on the program may have commercial arrangements with some of the companies mentioned. Before making any investment, insurance or financial planning decisions, you should consult a licensed professional who can advise whether your decision is appropriate for you.